I'd like to call this meeting to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of silent reflection for our servicemen and women throughout the world and also for those who have passed away in our community. Roll call, please. Mr. King? Here. Mr. Schuster? Here. Dr. Rothschild? Here. Mr. McAndrew? Present. Mr. Dunningham? Here. I'd like to make a motion to take from the table file of the council number 16, 2022. Second. There is a motion on the floor and a second to take from the table file of council number 16, 2022. This this piece is being taken from the table and placed in seventh order for a final vote. This ordinance is the HUD 2022 annual action plan, and it had been a table to allow for a 30-day public comment period. On the question? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. Please dispense with the reading of the minutes. Third order, 3A, minutes of the Civil Service Commission meeting held May 3rd, 2022. 3B, minutes of the Civil Service Commission meeting held June 7th, 2022. 3C, minutes of the Civil Service Commission meeting held December 2nd, 2021. 3D, check received August 9th, 2022 from Comcast in the amount of $265,611.17. For quarterly franchise fee payment. 3E, single tax office city funds distributed comparison reports 2021 2022, year to date August 5th, 2022. 3F, minutes of the historic architectural review board meeting held July 14th, 2022. 3G, controller's report for the month ending July 31st, 2022. 3H, minutes of the Scranton Firefighters Pension Commission meeting held July 20th, 2022. 3I, minutes of the Non-Uniform Municipal Pension Board meeting held July 20th, 2022. 3J, agenda for the Non-Uniform Municipal Pension Board meeting held August 17th, 2022. 3K, minutes of the Scranton Police Pension Commission meeting held July 20th, 2022. 3L, minutes of the Composite Pension Board meeting held July 20th, 2022. 3M, overtime review for all departments as provided by City Controller dated August 22nd, 2022 for the period January through August, 2022. 3N, minutes of the Scranton Redevelopment Authority regular meeting held July 6th, 2022. 3O, City of Scranton's American Rescue Plan Act updates, received August 31st, 2022, as provided by OECD ARPA Director. 3P, correspondence dated August 10th, 2022, from Thomas J. Anderson and Associates, Inc., regarding the financial requirement and minimum municipal obligation, MMO, for the City of Scranton's pension plan for 2023. 3Q, City of Scranton, second quarter 2021-2022 revenue comparison report received from the City Business Administration Office dated August 31st, 2022. 3R, correspondence to the Honorable Government Tom Wolf dated September 6, 2022 from Scranton Mayor Cognetti, Scranton City Council, Dunmore Mayor Conway, and Dunmore Council regarding the Keystone Sanitary Landfills request to the Department of Environmental Protection. Are there any comments on any of the third order items? <clears throat> if not, received and filed. Do any council members have any announcements at this time? I have one. Um, so Sunday, September 18th, 
12 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, will be the Lebanese Heritage Festival at St. Anne's Mary Night Catholic Church on 1320 Price Street, uh, Scranton, PA. So uh, it's a great event, great Lebanese food. So uh, if you can make it and support them, that'd be great. That's all I have. <coughs> I have a few quick ones. Um, while we were uh, on break, there were a number of great um, festivals and things that took place um, during the month of August, uh, one being the Electric City Flower uh, Show, and I know that uh, Norma Jeffries is involved with that. I was up, uh, was able to attend that. That was, that was great. It was really, really nice and well attended. And, uh, it was held up at Naog Park. Um, also, the um, Electric City Classic, the bicycle race, which was held downtown. I was able to get downtown for a little bit of the race on Saturday, but then on Sunday I was able to go over to the hill climb race. That was pretty exciting. Kind of a unique event for our city, and it, it was amazing how it drew so many people you know, out into the neighborhood uh, up in the hill section. So I thought that was pretty, pretty awesome. And um, also the La Festa Italian, uh, just this past weekend, um, unfortunately Monday, yesterday was a, kind of a wash for everyone, but that was also a, a great weekend and, and brought a lot of people into our city and generated a lot of business for our vendors. So uh, congratulations to Chris DiMatteo and all his volunteers um, for that. <laughs> also, uh, as mentioned earlier tonight uh, during caucus from Eileen Cipriani, um, thrilled to announce that the city is going to receive a DCNR grant of $481,000 for Robinson Park on East Mountain. Um, so that cuts a big chunk out of that $1.2 million that they're hoping to do for the rehab uh, of Robinson Park. So it's all good news. Uh, thank you. Do any other council members have any announcements? Uh, I, had a, I had a couple. Uh, I agree uh, with Councilman King that there were a lot of great events over the course of August. I went to uh, the ones that he had mentioned as well and, and really enjoyed um, getting to see so many community members uh, just enjoying the the city and and what we have to offer so um, it's one of my favorite parts about the the summer is having so many of those different outdoor events and, and going to the parks and um, I wanted to uh, mention that the grant applications were open for wellness programs um, that had opened up uh, back on August 22nd but uh, the grant application period is open until September 16th, and uh, this would be for nonprofit organizations, private entities, or government agencies uh, to help address key areas of community wellness. And um, the application can be found on the website. Uh, it's covered under part of ARPA, um, so the ARPA section of our website is where that application could be found. And uh, some of the focus areas uh, that, that they're looking to fund include drug overdose prevention programs, behavioral health response and violence prevention, and wellness programs. Um, and one other thing that I wanted to mention, I'd seen in the paper that legislation is going in, into effect from the state um, to be able to better enforce the use of ATV or all-terrain vehicles within cities throughout Pennsylvania. So I was personally really happy to see that. Um, I hope that it helps to um, dissuade people from using their all-terrain vehicles on city streets. Uh, I know that the fall time is coming, um, so it still might be a problem for a couple more months before the cooler uh, weather hits. But um, if uh, people are caught, because it is illegal already, um, the police now could uh, potentially impound the vehicle or confiscate the vehicle from the person. So it uh, just gives some more teeth to uh, what local city police departments can do with regards to that. So I was just uh, wanted to bring that up in case anyone missed that. That's all. Thank you. Do any other council members have any announcements? I have a few. Uh, just quickly, the Council held an executive session this evening with the mayor and business administrator to discuss personnel issues. Um, also, if we look a little different uh, from to the audience at home, it's because uh, this is the first HD broad broadcast on ECTV of council meetings. Um, <clears throat> next, 
uh, some of our local state legislators are going to be holding a free uh, joint senior fair this Friday, September 9th, uh, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, the event's sponsored by State Senator Marty Flynn, State Representative Bridget Kozarowski, State Representative Kyle Mullins, and State Rep Representative Tom Welby. Uh, it will be from 11 to 2 at the Marketplace at Steamtown. It's a, one, it's a free one-stop shop featuring 60-plus vendors, health and wellness screenings, information from local, state, and federal agencies, plus much more. Uh, there is free three-hour indoor parking uh, with validation from any mall, per, any mall, <coughs> excuse me, any mall merchant. Um, also, I got a request from a resident who recently, or recently took advantage of uh, the free smoke alarm and carbon monoxide detector installation program offered by the Scranton Police Department. Um, she just wanted to express how, <coughs> how uh, convenient and helpful it was. Um, and if anyone would like to take part in that program, uh, they could call 570-969-6607, extension one, and the fire department will come out and install uh, free smoke detectors and carbon, mono carbon monoxide detectors. Uh, and that's all I have. Uh, Mr. Voldemort? Fourth order, citizen participation. First on the list tonight is Joan Hodewanitz. Um, what is the status on the negotiations on the union contracts? They are still ongoing. You know, it's been eight months now since those contracts <clears throat> expired. And uh, it was interesting to see that in July we paid Uffberg and, Association, uh, and Associates $31,393.75. So the cost, the meter for that cost is still ticking. And what is the status on the 2021 audit? We are still hopeful that we will receive it by September 30th. Oh, we're down to hopeful now. Okay. We, so we paid uh, Rainy and Rainy, by the way, $3,851.25 in July for audit prep. So one of these years we're going to get it right. But so I will, I will say that when we put this out for bid and we have a discussion and we have a discussion on the contract moving forward, we're going to put September 30th as a hard. Good. Deadline. That should be in the engagement letter. Now the capital budget. My first question is, did I miss the legal announcement and the legals about that caucus? Didn't that have to be announced in the paper? Was that publicized? I don't, I don't know. Okay, I thought we, I thought we advertised caucuses in the legal proceedings. I'll look into see what was okay, advertised. Okay, because I think a lot of people were unaware that that was going to come down tonight. And speaking of the capital budget, um, good news, bad news. It was certainly the most detailed uh, document I've seen in years. So I think that that was a good thing. It laid out a long-term plan. Although, I got to tell you, those, um, Frank, those spreadsheets, I needed a magnifying glass to read those when I printed them out. So, I, I don't know I, about so, you guys. So, I, I saw the same thing, and I'm going to, we're going to send a request to get bigger spreadsheets yeah. on the, because sometimes they, when you put that into a PDF and it gets transferred over, they shrink a little bit, but I yes, was I had the same reading. problem. But having said that, when I got down to the part about the city hall feasibility study and the, and the expansion building, that, that kind of set me off on edge. We're spending a lot of money, number one, on renovating this building. And again, it's long term, but this is the city hall. During COVID, most of the people were working from home remotely and operations continued. So I'm wondering about, now I can see that the building needs updates, ADA accessible and other issues, wiring and internet and the whole nine yards. I understand that, but I'm not convinced that we need another building, number one. Uh, number two, 
This raises the whole issue. I still would like to know what's going on with the restricted access to this building. To my knowledge, it is the only government building in Scranton that has restricted access after COVID. So if COVID is not the issue and there's some kind of security issue, surely we need to discuss that and try to find another fix because the public should have access to this building. I understand that you can call and make an appointment, but that puts off a lot of people that, that the government's not here to serve them, that they must request an appointment to get a government service. That stinks, okay? We need to look at that very closely. Also, the um, disabled access door in the back during the daytime that's locked, they used to have a sign there that says to get access through this door, press this buzzer. After COVID, they took that sign down and it's never been replaced. So how would somebody disabled know how to get into the building? And I pointed this out to the mayor in July. It's September 6th, that should be fixed. So I, I, I want to know how long they're gonna restrict access to this building, why, and what we're gonna do about disabled access. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the list, Faye Franis. Faith Ferranis, Granton. Tonight I, I'd like to say to the council that I, I gave you some envelopes and everything that's in there is all documents, emails, and information that I got from the city to back up everything I'm gonna tell you tonight. This, everything is backed up. This started in the beginning of August. I went to Chick Bellman Park over in Pinebrook. I go there with my sister and we walk around the field for exercise every day. And we go to Connell Park and we go to Cloverfield and Grace Park and Robinson Park. But anyway, this particular Sunday morning, we went and there was 200 football players there on the field practicing from Lackawanna College. And there was many people like mothers and their small children that usually come because I know them, I see them there. And they come and they put a blanket down on the field and the kids run around and play and they have music with them. They couldn't do that because they're the football players. They had to turn around and go home. This was not just one or two, this was like five or six people. Because these, these people, these players are there for hours and hours. So not only that, they're, they're ruining the field. What was grass now is dirt. When you look at the field, you will see grass, but, it, but you have to walk onto the field. You will see like 40, 50 spots to just this dirt. And right now it's wet, so it's hard. But once this dries, like the hot heat, it's like dirt this high. You can just run through it and like, pick, you know, pig pen, dirt all over. So I wrote, when I came home, I wrote a letter to 311 scrantonpa.gov where you ask questions and get answers from the city if you have to get questions <coughs> answered. So August 8th, I wrote questions to Marissa Duffy, Director of Parks and Recreation. And since I had to wait nine days to the 17th to get an answer, in the meantime, I went and I looked and see if I could get the answers myself to some of these questions. Some of the questions I asked, and I'll tell you, one was, who gave Lackawanna College permission to use Chick Bellman Field? And they said, Marissa Duffy answered the parks director, which is herself. The next question I asked, does Lackawanna College own the field at the end of Sweeney Beach? There's a field at the very end of Sweeney Beach, a football field, a beautiful, big football field. Does Lackawanna College own that? And she replied, no. Well, that's not true. Like I said, I found out the answers while waiting for her to reply. She said no, but the answer is yes. Eric Larson, the executive, the athletic director, told me himself on the phone, yes indeed, Lackawanna College does own it. And the assistant director of athletes told me that too. Uh, and someone from the city also told me, and I got the pin number from Marie. She went to this county and got the map. And we looked that up and Lackawanna College has owned that for years. So, Marissa Duffy either is lying deliberately or she, she should certainly know the answer to these questions. And there's some, all these questions I will tell you, they're, they're not true. The other question was, is there any written agreements between Lackawanna College and, and the Parks Department or the city? She wrote back, she said there's uh, internal documents for office use and use agreement with city council. 
where there is no use agreement with City Council. Council has not heard one word from the Parks Department from Marissa Duffy. They just never heard from them. So I want to show you some pictures of the field. Oh, she also said, I said, did you get council approval? And she said, uh, council was off for August recess, but we had it on the agenda before the recess. It has never been on the agenda. Frank Bolenberg told me that himself. Now I want to show you some pictures of the dirt at Chick Bellman Field. Take a look at this. This used to be grass. Now look at this. This is Lackawanna College football field at the end of Sweeney Beach on Poplar Street. Look at this. Do you think that's a small field? Look at that. That's a huge football field. Eric Larson told me the reason they don't use that field is because it's too small. That is hardly small. Now look at this. This is the beautiful grass right next to where the Lackawanna College at Chick Bellman Field practices, right next to where they practice. Look how nice the beautiful grass is. That should tell you something, what they did. Here's another picture. And on the very top, I don't know if you can see it, there's the grass where, where they don't use it. But this is the dirt. So I don't know what's going on, but I'd like to know why Lackawanna College is also paying to use this field. So how much are they paying and who decided? And there's no agreements at all. How could they, there's no insurance. And I gave you pictures of a 12-foot umpire chair. For 20 days, it was standing up in the field. They just took it down last week for the first time. They laid it down. Very dangerous. And there's no insurance, nothing. No agreements, anything. Please check into this council. Thank, thank you. you. I'll, I'll, I'll address what I know about this in fifth order, OK? Thank you. I won't be here, but thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. it. Next, you. next on the list is Les Spindler. Good evening, Council Les Spindler, City Resident, Homeowner. Uh, well, we're coming up on almost a year now since I was here and told about the DPW supervisor coming and painting lines on the intersection where I live. And he said, we'll be here before the cold sets in. Obviously, that never happened. Came here in the spring and asked when it's going to happen. I'm told all the time, oh, you're on the list, you're on the list. Here, we're almost a year later, and the problem still isn't solved. And I happened to bump into the mayor when I came in tonight. She was leaving. I let her know about it, so she took all the information. So I hope something is finally done. And I also told the temporary director, West, and he said he would speak to the mayor. So, and I know Councilman Donahue, I spoke to you with the National Light Out. And yes, he and, says would look and we keep it. on. I keep being told I'm on the list, but that's. It's not helping. Like I said, we're coming up on a year now. Before you know it, the snow's going to be flying. I hate to say that, but <laughs> time is moving quickly. So I hope something's done. And I even told the mayor, you know, I think if Tom Preambo was still in charge of DPW, this would have been done already. Tom got things done. And uh, I don't know why he's not director anymore, but I, said, I told the mayor I'm not pleased by that. I said, I told her point blank, I don't like the way the city's being run now. The DPW director went on leave, then mysteriously he resigns, and no explanation why. The mayor told me, oh, it's a personnel issue. Every time they don't want to answer a question, it's a personnel issue. And it seems like we're going back to the Doherty administration. That's the way things happen. Same with our former police chief, Nemetka. I don't know. I said to the mayor, he was doing a great job. Yeah, he was. So why was he replaced? No explanation for that either. I know what it is. And I've known Len Metcalf for a long time. He told me the whole story. I'm not going to get into it for television, for the public to know. But I, I think the people in this city should know what's going on. And, and like, like uh, excuse me. <laughs> Uh, I agree that uh, we should be able to get into City Hall. And I told that to the mayor. I said, you know, in my lifetime, I've lived in the city my whole life, and uh, we've never had a security problem in City Hall. And I said that to her. Well, she said, I'm not going to have people running in and out of City Hall as they please. I said, that, that's ridiculous. We, I said, why don't you put a police officer there? She said, well, we can't afford it. Well, there's got to be an explanation that this city hall belongs to the citizens of this city. 
and we should have access. We shouldn't have to make an appointment. I think it's ridiculous. If you go to the county building, there's sheriff's deputies there. Maybe we, we should be able to hire some kind of security. Have a, let, let's get a, a metal detector. But like I said, there's never been a security issue in this in City Hall, as long as I've been lived in this city. Uh, next thing. Uh, the mayor did tell me that I guess she's getting together with council on a dangerous dog legislation. I was happy to hear that. And my advice would be to be uh, maybe Google different cities in Pennsylvania, as I did when my dog was attacked several years ago. And like I said, Pittsburgh, if your dog is deemed to be a dangerous dog, you have to have a 10-foot high fence and insurance on that dog. So that's just one idea. Okay, moving on. When I read about the landfill wanting to dump all that leachate in the Lackawanna River, I, I just couldn't believe what I read. That, that's just outrageous. When I was growing up, the, city, the, the river was terrible. It's been cleaned up really nice now. And to allow that, what I think the number was like 200,000 gallons a day. Or I wouldn't allow a gallon a day, never mind 200,000 gallons, that's, that's unfathomable. I can't believe anybody would even consider letting that happen. Uh, next thing, I received the smoke detectors and the people, were, the firefighters were terrific, they were in and out in a hurry. They would have been out faster, but I kept talking to them. <laughs> uh, quickly, uh, all phase electric on Kapausa Avenue, I brought this up a while ago. There were broken windows, blah, blah, blah. I went by today, all the glass was cleared up, the windows are boarded up, so that's a good thing, but I hope somebody takes care of that bill, takes it over and does something with that building. Thank you. Thank you, Les. Uh, next on the list, Rick Little. Hello, I'm Rick Little. Um, I'd like to talk about, uh, I read the paper today about um, the mayor wanting to get people on boards, but I always look at it carefully because our boards, commissions, and you know, it's always comes down to a word. Uh, anyway, I, I put in my application a couple weeks ago uh, because I'm having a hard time living in Scranton Housing Authority. I've lived there since 2009, and there's an atmosphere of fear. Uh, and I think it's based on, uh, I think it's based on the, the, the prominent law enforcement power figures, like the district attorney being there, and then everybody in the staff, you know, if you don't do this, you know, you're gonna be evicted, you're, you're gonna have to pay the court fees. And I've been through that, you know, I found out that anybody who complains about stuff, first thing they do, they send you up to the executive, Carl or not, and, and then if it's not resolved, they just ignore you. you know? and, and they have a, there's no rule of law in it. And, and the important thing to Scranton is, because I, I've been doing right to know after, after over 10 years of coming to City Hall and trying to find out Who's in charge here? Is, does anybody know what's going on? And I haven't found anybody that, that knows what's going on, but I live there, I know what's, I can see what's going on. And just recently with the, with the what is it, three police officers, you know, getting federal funds, you know. Uh, I, 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 I wish I had a right to know, but I'd like you to know that I did some pretty poignant right to knows and I, I did them with the city of Scranton, and they come, oh, well, we don't know anything about them. You, you have to go to the Scranton Housing Authority right to know officer, which I did, and uh, I'm, you know, uh, I haven't gotten those documents yet, but the good thing about right to know, it becomes public documents, so all of you can see 
What I'm asking, because we had fires every single week. The fire alarm would go off, and then suddenly it stopped about, about three years ago. And I'm a filmmaker, you know, it just didn't make sense. How can you have a fire every single week, and then, and then it stops, you know? And, and then the construction started, and it, it, construction went on for two years, and then the COVID, and all, all these things. It, and there was never a person to go to. But the, the structure of it, you know, in a company there's a president or, you know, a, a, a hierarchy of what's in charge. The way they run it, they have this like, it's almost like a prison guard. It's like this woman, it's always a woman who, who you can't t ask her anything, you know. And it's not a personal thing, this is, this is by design. So no one has names, no one has accountability. If you ask them, like I was in family court for, for 15 years. I learned how courts work, and I, I was evicted from, from Scranton Housing Authority, and I almost died do, doing the, the uh, notice of appeal because I had to learn Pennsylvania court procedure. And what I discovered is over the, in the Court of Common Pleas, and, they're, I was the only one who was doing court procedure. Everything else is like passing it off. You know, go out in the hall and, and make your decisions. And that's, how, that's why so many people are evicted because they get taken to court, they're filled with the fear, you know, and, and, and then they go out and they sign something and they move you around. But this is a problem. This is a big, big problem for, for because I know so many people that are evicted. I know people that have had their property in their storage areas just taken away. And, and then they're evicted. Now, you know, if you, it's unfair legal practice. And in seeing New York State Court, family court, how it worked, uh, I understand a criminal record when I see it. But I'm running to be on the Board of Commissioners for Scranton Housing, so maybe I can make things better from the inside. And then there's the right to know, to try to put it together of who's actually thank running the show, because Scranton doesn't have a... Thank you, Mr. Thing on it. Thank you. Next on the list, Dave Dobson. Good evening, Council. Dave Dobson, resident of Scranton, homeowner. Uh, I have a question myself. Why, when somebody else gets their eyes on the uh, something we have, it's always given away, and I'm not accusing the mayor or anybody else, I read the article today, send dumps water to the sewer plant, I saved this from about a month ago. Now, that is lechate water, and uh, years ago there, were, there was a scandal about battery casings from Gould Battery. Uh, and large old battery being buried there. People threw televisions away. We can't do it anymore, but it was done for years. And time and time again, I mean, we even have crudite, crudite in there. <laughs> uh, but the point in being that that should continue to be shipped to the land or the, uh, the sewer plant. And I'm not interested in their water, and that is flowing into a tributary of the gorge. So uh, any pollutants that flow out of there are going into the Nayog Gorge and the creek, and that's a national landmark. So I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Denaples, but that's not right. That's not right at all. We don't need this, and I hope that council is totally adamant in 
militarized practically to the point where we don't want any more. And 200,000 gallons a day is liable to turn into 600,000 gallons or a million gallons a day. That is gonna uh, go up by 300%. And it was mentioned on security with the daytime. I think we should have a policeman present in the front door, at the front door, and include the elevator. Because when these things happen, somebody, some crazy yaya decides that he's going to take, uh, take revenge on somebody, it's too late. It's too late. It could easily be done. I have a little bit more of a plan in my mind, but uh, we, I'm starting to run low on time. Uh, COVID, I ducked it two times this summer. People are not getting vaccinated because they think there's microchips in the syringe. And, uh, you know, you got a cell phone in your pocket and <laughs> the, they know where you're at if they want to. And I saw that Snowden, uh, uh, like a documentary on him, he's the guy that ran to Russia and fled to Russia over all of these. If you have an, an iPhone, they can turn that camera on. They can record what you're sitting there at a kitchen table. I mean, I had a party I, I, this summer, a disgruntled vet, and he was talking about all kinds of baloney, you know, uh, it, playing with his iPhone. You know, that's like, that's like having Big Brother sitting right next to you, you know? So, unless you remove the battery out of that, and, uh, I mean, talk about stupid, you know? Uh, and, uh, once again, I was kind of mixed on this. Uh, I wore my Ship of Fool shirt for the, uh, uh, Trump appointees to the courts. And you have all these little skeletons here. <laughs> I mean, it just got, I wasn't going to do it until the decision yesterday that stopped the investigation on compartmentalized top secret information and packets in his possession at Mar-a-Lago. And who knows where the the uh, contents of those packets are. Maybe he just took the packets, I don't know. But it's really getting to the point where I agree with uh, our Thank president. You, you know, uh, democracy's in trouble. Thank you and have a good Thank night. Thank you, Mr. Dobson. That exhausts the sign-in sheet for this evening. Would anyone else like to address council? Good evening, Marie Schumacher. Uh, I was really disappointed when I came in here tonight. I thought that we were going to have decent acoustics when you came back from recess, but no. And it would have made the uh, unannounced uh, start of your meeting, uh, being that caucus, I would have liked to have heard what was said, but you can't. All you can do is sit back there and twiddle your thumbs because you just can't hear. You really have to do something, or at least let us know when you're having a been, caucus like that. It should be. I agree. All caucus, be. All, we have a public caucus every week, but, and that's and that's advertised at the beginning of the year to start at five forty-five. Five forty-five. Yes. Yeah. But the meeting on your agenda is six thirty. That is your thing. We can come or not. Anyway. Uh, no more time. I want to, again, uh, as well, thank the, the committee that put on the La Festa. They did a wonderful job, and the uh, entertainment was simply amazing. I, so I hope people come out even more next year, but I do want to thank them. Uh, now, I, went, I did a right to know to the county, and on the exempt properties. 
We are at 38%, people. It is time, it is beyond time, where you have to decide to do a HUP test. Uh, I took it to the county, and the county said, that's a, that's a Scranton thing. It, the city should do it. So I really think you need to uh, take that under consideration. Uh, again, uh, oh, and I was really disappointed. Uh, I, on the, se on the 1st of July, there was a bid submitted for the East Mountain Stormwater and Drainage Study. And I certainly thought it would be on tonight's agenda. I don't know, how can you take two months to select a contract? There, there were three bids, one of which I think should have been disregarded, but you know, why? Um, Mr. Donahue, you said we have to have that to get going and, I, and well, so we'll light a fire <laughs> under somebody. This is crazy. I'm, and I'm expecting that either this week or next week, that, yeah, well, that legislation. I expected it before that. Um, let's see, that was five. Uh, and 5i, I have a problem with that. I think that is very disrespectful to uh, people in the city. That's, again, asking for, I mean, if you can't find a fiscal coordinator within the city, I mean, that, that is, that's a slap in the face as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and then, uh, yes. Um, when are we going to get 8A back on? What's holding that up? We um, are. You, you could answer it in five if you, I mean okay. in five if you can, because it's I've got a lot of other stuff that I've been holding. Um, uh, well, the leachate. I agree. I don't think that that should be in our water. And I, I, um, I was glad that the mayor and you all got involved, but to me, what you did was say, okay, um, we tried. We went to the governor and, you know, we couldn't do anything, but I, I think this is totally crazy. And... I think perhaps that's all, and my time is pretty much up anyway. Oh, good Lord willing, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address council? Tom Coyne, Manuka. Before recess, uh, a couple sessions beforehand, I had asked on the police who were under suspension or under administrative leave for a de uh, driving under the influence. Originally, they had just been put on suspension because the blood alcohol had not come back. I know it has since then, and it has gone through courts. And after that, there was a question that came before this body. I brought up the question of how many of the total of police and firemen in this city are on administrative leave uh, or un under suspension at this point. Just a number. I'm not even concerned of what they've done in particular. Just a number of how many police officers who we supposedly have and how many fire department personnel that we are supposed to have out there on the books that actually aren't because they're on uh, administrative leave for their activities. Uh, I know there was a, DW, a DUI. We have a police officer who's recently reported uh, uh, to allegedly uh, theft by fraud by billing for time uh, through, uh, I believe, federal funds uh, for a job that he did not perform. And we've recently had a fireman who's uh, 
uh, was liberating tools from a hardware store up in uh, Dixon City. Uh, they're all concerning as public citizens and there was also a question on whether or not these personnel who might be in jail for the time, whether or not they were being paid uh, using paid time off, leave, whatever they have. There comes a question of once they are convicted, they have violated their oath of office. They should no longer get pay, they should be gone, and they should not be protected by the union. The oath of office is what binds them to that job. Once they have violated that oath, they should be severed from it, and there is no response. You violated the oath of office. You are no longer eligible, period. I've taken a look at the zoning ordinance, shifting to that. I looked at what was changing. I looked at the details of it. I looked at the fact that it's based on percentage of population according to the documentation. So the costs out of the nine separate, separate municipalities, Scranton foots 70% of the entire bill. Some areas, such since it's done by population, such as West Abington, will foot 0.2% of the entire bill. That's built right into that multi-assessment for the nine municipalities. I looked at what was being changed in it. And I, over this break, I realized I was being bamboozled. I looked at something, and I started analyzing it, and I forgot the biggest thing of all. We looked at the city charter, the home rule charter, and it's been 50 years, and we say, it's good as it is. We don't need to go back and review it. But this zoning ordinance has been in place for 12 years, I believe. Why? It's almost 30. Okay, 30 years. Why do we? 92, 93. Okay. Why do we need to change it? What is deficient in the zoning that is currently in operation that we need to actually change the zoning? I don't see anything in the old zoning that cannot be fixed by amendment that we need an entire new zoning regiment. I see some things such as the hospital zoning being put in place so that unlike other things that come before the zoning board, when they ask for a variance, it gets struck down by the community by having zoning changed for the hospital beforehand, it liberates the hospital near Nayog Park from having to come before a variance and have the citizens be able to protest. I see certain areas that should be residential put to business. I see personal hands in it. But the main question is, why do we need this? <laughs> what is deficient in what is out there that requires this change? Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address council? Mr. Voldemort. Fifth order, 5A motions. Mr. King, do you have any motions or comments? Um, just one, I, I was contacted by a uh, <clears throat> citizen who utilizes the pool over at uh, Weston Field, the indoor pool. And apparently people pay a fee to be a member over there and there's like adult swimming that goes on. It's supposed to be Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 9.30, lap swimming. And, and, and these are adults. Um, 9.30 to 10.30, there's like an exercise rehab type thing that goes on. But apparently, in over the last month or so, and I'm sure it may have a lot to do with students going back to college or kids going back to high school. Um, I, I think the excuse was given that there, there's no um, available lifeguards, but they've been canceling, like first they took away Tuesday and Thursday, then they took away a Monday, and um, you know, it's been scaled way back over the past few weeks, and, and they're canceling a lot. So um, this individual 
um, you know, lives in the city, taxpayer. They utilize it quite a bit for exercise, and um, <clears throat> I, I don't think that uh, we're fulfilling, you know, our obligation to the citizens when we're, you know, we're not providing lifeguards and being able to provide the service, which actually they're they're paying they're paying for. So um, I don't know. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Voldenberg if you could just send something over to Parks and Rec to get an idea as to what's going on, as to why um, this uh, is, is being canceled. And you know, once again, are these people will they be reimbursed, or will there be time made available to make up for the days that were missed? Um, and, and all the person really wants to do is to be able to have to exercise. It's a retired individual, and it's not just one um, person's speaking only on their behalf, but had indicated that a lot, it's affecting a lot of people. So if you could look into that, um, I'd be greatly appreciated. I will. And, and I've sent you a, a number of individual concerns that citizens um, throughout the city have contacted me about. And, I appreciate that you're, you're forwarding those to the appropriate departments and, and following up on them. So I want to thank you because sometimes people think, you know, we're away in August, but we're away from meetings, but we're not away from meeting with citizens and, and talking on the phone with them about concerns or answering emails. So uh, I, I appreciate um, your quick uh, attention to all those concerns and, and, and quick responses. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. King. Mr. Schuster, do you have any motions or comments? <clears throat> yes, I have a few for tonight. Um, thank you, Frank, for, for all of the correspondence that you help us with and all, all of the uh, coordination to repeat Mr. King. And also to, uh, you know, mirror Mr. King, the, the Weston Park. Uh, twice tonight I heard of um, wellness programs, um, ARP money used for wellness programs, things like that. The situation in Weston Field, this is a wellness program. I know that people take their time at Weston Field seriously. Um, from the, the kids swim at seven o'clock, I don't know if it's still at seven o'clock, but I utilized that at one point in time and I noticed that the people that came to those, um, whether it be laps, aerobics, things like this, they took it pretty seriously and they took the time there seriously. So this is something that I don't think we're being, that's being provided for our taxpayers. So I, I hope to see the answer for that request there. Um, I'm going to have a couple requests tonight, Frank. So prior to the break, we discussed street signs. And I know that we got a grant at one point in time for street signs. I know we received the money for that grant. They had, they had a rollout, an article in the paper, maybe a news story about street signs were going out. But it was just a grant, and it was just for so many signs. So can we please send correspondence to the administration and to DPW? Now, the only response I got back when I asked this question in public last time was, a DPW worker told me that DPW was not involved with that project. It was outsourced to another company. So can we get an update on street signs if there's a plan, if there's a timeline to work on some more street signs? I'll reach out, sir. Thank you. That's number one. Um, <coughs> did During the meeting, I forwarded you an email about Kaiser Valley storm drain and cleaning. So I forwarded that over. Um, one of the residents up there sent um, sent an email with pictures. He did send it to, I think, myself and Mr. West. I forward it to you, but if you could follow up on that, please. Um, Kaiser Valley Community Center, there was line items put in the budget for them. They have contacted me several times. Um, I put in emails to the administration. I have not got a response yet. Um, I started working on that in probably December of 21, and really th this community center hasn't received any of the funding that was allocated for them. Um, Next, uh, it was brought up in public comment by more than one person tonight that restricted access to the, the building. Um, it's something I brought up before. I, I don't think it's right. When the mayor was here, she expressed that that's the way it's going to be and that's the way it's going to stay. So I don't know if you heard that that night that she was here, but that's what she said. And I think I, I had asked if it was due to COVID. I, I felt it was due to COVID, but at this point in time, it doesn't seem to be the case. And I think it was the response was it's security. So I, I don't think. Um, this is appropriate. Um, I, I've gotten many phone calls from people that come into the building, many people that call these numbers that are in the lobby, and they don't get an answer. They get a voicemail or a, a full voicemail. So could we please send correspondence over to the mayor as to what the plan is going to be for citizen access to this building? I'll ask those questions, sir. 
All right, let's see what's next. Also, while we're sending that over, outside groups that, that pop up in the city that um, want to work in our community or want to have um, joint projects with the city, could we please ask the mayor and the administration what is our process for vetting these groups? Um, early on our, our time off here, which I, I kind of wish we didn't have time off, I wish we continued to work through the month, I got several calls about a group that has been working with the city um, that doesn't seem to be properly vetted. Um, some of the members of the group have criminal records. Um, one of the members of the group has an active fentanyl arrest. Um, so I'd just like to know what is the city's process for vetting these outside groups that they collaborate with in the city? I'll do that. Um, also, Mr. Coyne's question, the number of employees, can we also send that over to the administration? What is, not names, just the number of employees by department that are on administrative leave or have been suspended. Also, I think uh, Mr. Dunn, who's gonna touch on it, um, Ms. Fran has brought up tonight the uh, Chick Feldman Field. While we're, we're sending over those requests, can we find out, do we have an agreement with Lackawanna College? I know the school district has an agreement for games, but not practices, so do we have an agreement with them? This might be a question for Mr. Dunn, who at the Shared Service Committee meeting, was the HUP test brought up that, that was on the agenda? There was, and I'm going to touch on that too. Okay. So that was something, the, the HUP test was brought up at the Shared Service Committee meeting. It was put on the agenda, and it was discussed. I, I haven't gotten an update on that yet, but it was discussed at that meeting. Let me see if there's anything else I have. Um, the decks, one, one thing I didn't touch on with the capital budget, and I think it was included in the capital budget, was the decks on the Davis Trail. I felt like in the past I was contacted that supplies were donated to the city to replace the decks on the Davis Trail. Can we please find out if, if that is still uh, something that's, uh, has that material been uh, donated to us, or do we plan on working on that? Because it was a surprise to see that it was in the capital budget, I thought it was something that the city was already working on. And then, I will, sir. Thank you. And just to clarify, we, we also discussed the FEMA extension. Um, as was stated tonight, that emergency happened in 2018. That's five years. Um, the city did go to FEMA or PEMA to get a extension. That was also stated tonight. I don't think it was stated clearly, but the city hasn't worked on any of those projects for the last several years, and they were granted an extension. I'm glad to see we were granted an extension, but I hope there's, pri there's priority put on this and these projects start. Um, that's all for tonight. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Dr. Rothschild, do you have any motions or comments? Um, yes, just a few quick ones. Um, just wanted to provide an update. I have been in more frequent communication with uh, Guy Singer over the past month, as well as uh, the neighbors in the Hill who have concerns about a Geisinger expansion. Um, and I had a um, great meeting with, with those neighbors uh, as well. And so um, Geisinger has been developing drafts to show the neighbors, which I thought had been in development earlier this year when we had um, spoken about it. But now um, that does seem to be occurring. And uh, I was told that by the end of this week, they should have something to show to council. There was something um, I'd already been shown, um, but it was really just uh, something very early, but at least gave an idea as to uh, what they were what they were thinking, um, which was was good to have some more of that that insight. Uh, and then uh, they plan on setting up uh, some stakeholder meetings uh, with the neighbors and interested parties. Um, which uh, I think will be helpful because I think um, they need to hear what the concerns are from the neighbors. I've heard many of them, and I'm sure they'll be coming to council to express those concerns too, uh, but that way um, they could have some further conversations about it and then be able to present their, um, their ideas and their, their draft plans uh, to see if it's something that, uh, that would work for the neighborhood. Um, so that's uh, the update that I have there. 
Uh, there were a few properties that I just wanted to check in on with Mr. Goldenberg. Uh, I, some of them I don't have the exact numbers for, but I know that we've talked about them before, so um, I know that you already have them. Um, there was a, a request for potential paving of the 600 block of North Webster Avenue, the other lower numbers uh, that uh, number of blocks on North Webster had been done over the summer, but uh, not the, the 600 block, and I had driven up there the other day, um, still not in great condition, so I wanted to see um, if that could be on a paving list in the future. Uh, there was also a property listed for demo, but not on the first list, so I wanted to see if it's on the next list that's located on the 600 block of Prescott that's in really bad shape. Um, and then another uh, issue with Prescott, an ongoing issue since I think the fire was back in March, February, March, that had taken place on the 400 block of Prescott Avenue, um, the uh, rental property uh, that's close to the old bingo hall there. And um, there were a number of, of concerns with debris and litter outside, and I think that's been taken care of, but uh, from one of the storms a few months ago, a very large hole had opened up in the sidewalk, uh, and that was going to be on the responsibility of the uh, property owner or manager, um, but that has not been taken care of, and the one of the neighbors has been um, in contact with me and complaining that the hole is getting larger and opening up, and I know they've been fearful to even park near it, um, and you know what might happen to, to the property that's that's adjacent to it. So um, that's something that uh, really needs to be taken care of. Uh, and I'd like some more answers from code enforcement as to what we're, we're doing about it. I'll ask them tomorrow. Thank you. And um, there are two other properties that I, I know there have been complaints about previously, and I'm not sure if they're going to the magistrate and what the, the status of them are. Uh, and those are both on Harrison, and they're like on opposing sides of Harrison. One is on the odd side next to 631 Harrison, and um, that's an empty vacant lot uh, that's, that's overgrown, and the neighbors are having issues with, um, with, with skunks and other, uh, other animals that are dwelling within the overgrown uh, greenery there and uh, they've been having to pay for traps for, for those skunks and animals almost on a weekly basis, they've been telling me. Um, and so I think it'd be important to get that vacant lot cleaned up. Uh, it's not really fair to the, to the neighbors there. And across the street, um, ongoing for years, never touched, the sidewalk is not usable. Um, a while back, I think the gentleman has moved, but he lived across the street on the odd side of Harrison and complained that um, people were frequently crossing the street because they couldn't use the sidewalk on that side uh, because of another overgrown vacant lot uh, that I've brought forward many, many times. Uh, and that's next to Harrison House on the 600 block as well. So all these, I know we've, we've talked about before, but um, I really wanna check back in on and uh, see what their status is and try to get them resolved. Uh, I'll follow up on them, Dr. Rothschild. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I think that's all that I have for tonight. Thank you. Mr. McAndrew, do you have any motions or comments? Yeah, I got a few. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, Mr. King brought up a concern. I'm not sure if it's the same person. So, when I spoke to this uh, lady, I said I would um, share her concerns in, in fifth order, and, and I will. So, this is the Weston Field swimming, uh, swimming pool, the indoor swimming pool. Right, and you know, on the website it says it's a full service community facility, right? Memberships. So this concerned resident, and you know, taxpayer, and a paying uh, member of Western Field Swimming Class Program has brought valid concerns to me about the days that the pool is available to her and other residents that pay to use this program as part of therapy and exercise. The residents stated that recently the pool went from being open five days a week to three days a week, and then now like one day a week without any notification. 
So, you know, I brought up some concerns to uh, Parks and Rec, uh, you know, uh, probably before recess, asking about the rules being changed. And, you know, we were advised by the Parks Director that um, she said we, she was urgent that we should uh, or strongly recommend that we look at the city website and, and you know, because obviously we were missing some stuff. So uh, these concerned residents were never notified, right? Most of them live in the city. Most of them are elderly. Most of them are uh, rehabbing from either knee replacements, and they're making progress. Their doctors are happy because of this. but. And I, and I guess, you know, I get the fact, and this resident said she gets the fact that, you know, lifeguards being students that are going back to school is an issue. But that should have been part of the thought process early on because they have memberships. And um, so I did take a look at the website. Nothing stating any, any changes in the hours of operation from going from five days to one day. I also looked at the social media page just, just in case. Nothing there to inform um, the residents or, or, or people with memberships that you know that they're lo no longer providing a service that they paid for. So, uh, Mr. Voldemort, would you please send correspondence on behalf of this concerned resident to the director of Parks and Rec just to see what's what's the plan moving forward? I will, right. Mr. Some McAndrew. people pay for the year, so it's unfortunate if they, if this service isn't being provided. Next, I just want to touch base or, 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 or you know, uh, agree with Mr. Schuster or Councilman Schuster about the restricted access. I received more complaints about uh, no one returning phone calls, um, voicemails being full, and a, an incident that, you know, with the animal control, a uh, concerned resident called me about it, that, you know, she tried to get a hold of animal control. Uh, she just, she didn't, she didn't really get satisfied. There's an issue with her cat and then a stray cat on the porch is constantly spraying. And so she decided, you know what? And she, you know, she's not one to always complain. She's, a, she's lived here her whole life. So she came down to City Hall. She couldn't even get in the building or past the vestibule. And she said the people that she did talk to was, were very nice at the office there. But the reason why she came down is because every, every department she called, the voicemail was full. And she couldn't even leave a message. And the ones that she did, no one would call her back. So she inquired and said, well, what's, is there anybody I can talk to in the building? I'll talk to anybody. And they said, well, you know, some people still work at home. Uh, the mayor's not, she wanted to see the mayor. The mayor wasn't in. She wanted to see the representative for the mayor's office. They weren't in. So, uh, you know, the restriction of getting in the building is one thing, but not even being able to communicate with the department or leave a message is, is just as bad. It's kind of like we're not even open or exist. So uh, I agree with Mr. Schuster. Send some correspondence down. Let's, let's try to get this fixed. All right. Um, all right, so as a teacher, I haven't gone back to school last week. The question of what did you do over the summer arises, right? You always say, what did you do on summer vacation? Um, teachers talk about it. Students talk about it. So. What did I do over council vacation? Uh, well, I begged administration through our solicitor, Mr. Gallagher, for transparency, answers, and updates regarding the power washer investigation and something that also came up to us that was presented to us in an email uh, from uh, the city controller about the former DPW director who resigned on June 11th is still getting paid with benefits. So this is, but this was some kind of unprecedented severance deal with no past practice. So the employee being investigated for the power washer incident has sat home from nine to 10 weeks getting paid. The former DPW director has been sitting home receiving pay and benefits since June 11th. And of course, Labor Council is also getting paid associated with these two concerns, with emails back and forth and, and discussion. So, as when I type this up, um, one of them ha has been rectified. All I can say is that the power washer investigation is over with, but I'm not privy because it was explained in executive session, the outcome. That's something that I believe the public should know. All right? So all these people that sat home all the summer, guess who was filling the bill for all this? All of you, the taxpayers. So 
with that said, I'm, I, I wanted to update all of you because it was a concern. I brought it up in June. So um, the answers that you probably still seek uh, officially will have to come from the mayor's office. Uh, and you know, in addition to that, the DPW thing, director thing, there's still not one posted. We're without a DPW director. Uh, we had a super. We had a supervisor that was out on administrative leave, so and it's still not posted. So I, we need to uh, uh, ask why that we're, there's not even looking to replace that position. It's a very important position. Uh, also, also, early in the summer, um, I went to visit some residents about multiple paving issues and sent some correspondence to OECD. I brought these up in, in public. Some streets were half paved, some were quarter paved, some were paved up the middle, right? So. And I, you know, I, these concerned citizens were very concerned. They walk out their door every day and see this, which is, is beyond belief. So, and you know, we were told, you know, uh, the utility is supposed to pave curb to curb. Well, they're not. And then they're saying, well, they don't have to. So there's, you know, there's some discussion there. So what I said was, uh, if, and I contacted OCD as to why these streets were not fully paved by the utility curb to curb. <clears throat> and if the city could use some ARPA money uh, like some cities across the Commonwealth are. The answer I received is that money would have to come out of the revenue loss component of the ARPA funds, okay? But they didn't say that they would put some of the money to do so. So the affected residents have created a petition requesting some help from the city to rectify this situation. Like I stated when I first brought forth these concerns that we should be working with our residents and not against that against them. So with that said, I'll be happy to sign this petition as to show my support for these residents. I will leave it here for after the meeting, so if anybody else here or any other fellow council members would like to sign it uh, or do the same, it'll be available. And then when that's done, Mr. Voldenberg, would you please put it in third order for next week and then send a copy over to administration? I will, sir. All right, the petition's right here. I'm going to sign it to show my support uh, for these residents. And I'll just leave it here if anybody would care to do so after the meeting. Okay, next. So, um, I need some clarification. And it's just, maybe it's something that we're missing, but, uh, you know, the work that's been going on over on uh, 1717 Wyoming Avenue and Ryerson Avenue. A concerned resident reached out to me, wanting to know if permits were pulled for the work. I know they were issued, they were probably issued, but they're not visible. I don't know if that's an issue uh, with the city, but... The, some of the work has been done on 1717 Wyoming Avenue and 1725 Ryer, Ryerson. Work has been taking place for three months at 1717 Wyoming, and work trucks are now at 1725 Ryerson Avenue. With no signs of permit, uh, permits, this was stated by the resident. So just, I would like some clarification. Could you reach out, Mr. Voldemort, please, to code enforcement and Mr. King, seeking answers to these questions? I will, sir. Thank you. All right, so, and um, I also received something earlier, on the way here actually, that I want to, it was brought to my attention, so I, I said I would take, I would definitely bring it up. So, the following pertains to 1800 Clearview Street. The residents are operating a food truck out of this address. I referred this to 311 email address and was told they are in compliance with zoning. I believe this is, area is zoned R1A. This is a new business operating without a variance. Every Tuesday, the business puts out its trash, which is picked up by the city refuse truck. It appears they back the food truck between the houses and transfer food from a shed, which, is, which was condemned after a fire, or the house to the food truck. If the city has a health department, it should be investigated. Trash is frequently stacked outside this shed. This truck also parks on Mulberry Street by the Geisinger CMC parking garage during the day with the generator protruding into the street. This is a metered area. Any help you can give uh, me will be appreciated by the residents of Clearview Street. Uh, I've spoke with the residents, I'm sorry, the neighbors, and we are not content to having this operation here. So 
I find a, a ton of food uh, safety violations here. Um, I'm not even going to go into all of them, but could you please send correspondence? I will for no, you have a copy of this email, I think. I do. Please send correspondence to the proper departments to because you know this sounds like someone can get very sick from, from you know. I'll reach out to not them all. Not maintaining time and temperature, so it looks a little scary. So please take care of that. And then I got I got one more. Um, that I got on my phone, and this is a gentleman who comes here all the time. Uh, and I apologize, I, I wasn't able to print it out because I just got it when I got here. But this is a gentleman who's here all the time. And where are you? Okay. This is from Derek Raines. So he's still having the same issues with uh, the drainage near his house in the driveway. This morning the bus could not let me off close enough to my driveway due to the water that is there. So I had to drive down the street at the end of the block where it's also a big hole at the corner that has been there for a long time. I know he brought that up. I had DPW uh, come out and I was assured that they would do something about this and it not, not has, nothing has happened. Now as the winter begins, I will f it will be very difficult for me to get in and out of my driveway with the electric power chair. This has been a problem for many years, which began with the water company, purchased a sewer authority, and, and took out storm drain access to the street, across the street from my driveway. Now the water just runs down my driveway to the backyard. So could you please take another look at this? I know I brought this up, and, and someone else did it a couple times. I mean, and there's pictures uh, that I, I think I have, or the old ones, but it's clearly a problem that hasn't been fixed yet, and we should take care of that. I will, sir. Thank you. And that is all I have. Mr. Schuster, you have one. Mr. Boldenberg, I'm going to uh, ask for your assistance once again. Could we reach out to uh, the mayor, uh, Larry West, and also possibly the Parks and Rec director to see if they could provide us with what our relationship is with the neighborhood associations? Um, I brought up earlier about the Kaiser Valley Neighborhood Association. They help with the community center there. Uh, Trip Park has the community center. I know we've had some uh, issues with the uh, East Mountain residents at the, the park in East Mountain. And then uh, I did get some phone calls this weekend um, about Pretzel Park in Green Ridge. Um, could we define our relationship with the neighborhood associations and how the, the city and the administration works with them? I know the residents in Green Ridge were a little upset about uh, vegetation, bushes, shrubs <coughs> being removed from Pretzel Park. Um, and I, I think they would have liked some input on it. But if we could just maybe get a, have the administration define what our relationship is with those associations. I'll ask those questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so as we return from our recess, I agree with Mark, I don't think that just because we go on a recess doesn't mean we go on vacation for the month. Um, we still field citizens' concerns. I still had my weekly meetings with the mayor. Uh, every week we were on um, recess except for one um, because she was on vacation. Uh, we've had multiple shared services committee meetings and or subcommittee meetings and we're actually making some progress which I will touch on in a minute. Um, pushing Geisinger to uh, you know, show the neighbors what is in their plan uh, in terms of the new zoning. Uh, that's just to name a few. Um, and I know we are still working on the sound system. We've done our measurements. We've, a bid should be going out in the next couple of weeks, uh, or a request for bids um, in terms of fixing the sound in here. And we're gonna pair that up with uh, also the sound in the governor's room because then we have the control panel back there. Um, again, we never got anything in return from the previous guy, uh, gentleman we used in terms of splitting it up and it was it, the price he gave us was over the bidding threshold so we couldn't just award him that work. We asked him to split it up to see if he could split it up, try to expedite the process, but we never received anything in return. Um, <clears throat> in terms of advertising, we always advertise our public caucuses. Our public caucuses start at 545. I don't know if, if I'm correct or not, but we do have a public hearing on the capital budget, which will be advertised this week and which will be held 
the 20th of September in two weeks. Um, so we, we do advertise for the public hearing, but our advertising requirements are, you know, we always have a public caucus at 545. Um, in terms of public access to the building, I do agree that the public should access the building. I just think we need to figure out a way where that is financially feasible and then pair that with security in the building. So if you go to the county government center, there is a one entrance for, for the public and then there's a security station and then you move in. When you go to the courthouse, there's one entrance, a security station, then you move in. The federal building, you could walk into the post office part of it, but then to get anywhere else in the building, you have to go through a security checkpoint. The difficulty we have here is trying to figure out ADA access. Because if we were to put a security checkpoint at both the front of the building, and we would have two different accesses, access points with two different security, which doubles the cost in terms of, but I, I agree that we should have that. We just need to figure out a financially feasible way to get that done. It would, from, from some of the estimates I've heard in terms of what it would cost to put an ADA accessible ramp in the front of this building, I mean, we could fix three of these, three of these towers uh, before we put a ramp there. You know, so I agree the public should have access to the building, but I do agree there are some security, not concerns, but there should be a security checkpoint you have to uh, move through to access the building. Um, I know uh, Mr. Schuster brought up, brought up Davis Trail. So the, I think it's, what was it, Azac? They donated the materials. Um, the Carpenters Union has donated the labor to install those materials, but there are still um, some more under some subsurface work that needs to be done to make sure that that is still propped up. And I think that's where that for, I just don't have my notes from that meeting, from the meeting I was in, mm -hmm. in terms of the additional work that needs to be done on the Davis Trail with the decks. But I will get back to, I will mention that um, next week. In terms of uh, Lackawanna's use of Chick Feldman Field, we should be getting a agreement with Lackawanna. A little backstory here, back in June, the school district basically said that Lackawanna, Lackawanna College can't use our facilities anymore. Um, they came back and allowed them to use the, because they used to practice at, both practice and play games at Memorial Stadium. They wouldn't practice on the field, but they would practice on that far end um, of Memorial Stadium where there was grass. They would practice there, they would do it at night. The school district said they can't do it. We have a good partnership with Lackawanna College in terms of the community overall. Also, they are one of the premier, basically junior college programs in the country. Um, so a short term solution for this year until we figure out a long term solution is to allow them to use Chick, Chick Feldman Field to practice and then the school district allowed them to, but we should be getting that memorandum of understanding we, that we have with Lackawanna College in the next couple weeks. Um, I hit on the sound system. In terms of the hub test, I'm hopeful that, you know, we're, we're working out some legal uh, shared services with uh, the school district. I know Ms. Schumacher's brought up uh, sending represent, rep, representation to uh, assessment appeals. So I think we're gonna, we're working on a way to split up those duties where the city might take on um, delinquent property taxes where, and then the school district would, to represent both, uh, both bodies since we both have the same interest there. And we, you know, after we get that situated, it's moving into how do we separate out the cost of a hub test? Um, Cause it's not, it, it's basically something we would have to put out and a law firm would have to take on that task for us. Um, but I mean, in terms, I know we've, 
been talking about this for the five years I've been on council, I actually do feel like it is on the verge of actually happening and not just an idea to keep on talking about. Um, in terms of council and the mayor's letter on uh, the landfill putting in leach it, I, I disagree that it's just a way of saying we did something. I just think this is a first step in this process. There's still public comment periods uh, that the DP, DEP will, will be holding that I'm sure that a lot of us will be uh, participating in when those happen to provide public comment. Um, I don't know exactly when they are, um, but I know that that was a part of the article in this, this morning's paper. Um, I believe that you know in everyone up here and even the mayor uh, both ran on, both campaigned on being against uh, the landfill expansion in any way, and I don't think we're just going to let uh, let them just do whatever they want. I think you know we're going to do what we can on a local level um, to express our opinions there. Um, in terms of 8A with the zoning, we have. When will it be brought back? First off, um, I'm hopeful to have it brought back in October at some point. We've given Geisinger more than enough time to reach out to the neighbors. That is basically the only issue that is still left outstanding. Um, I know Mr. King is working on detailing the changes that were made from the original draft to an amended draft, and we want to be able to put those out in time for people to review before we hold another public hearing, which we will hold on any changes, uh, you know, so people could address any, citizens can address any changes that are made um, to that zoning, to the zoning ordinance. Um, even though we're technically not, we've technically met our legal requirement on a public hearing, we will hold another one before it comes up on a, on, a, on a public vote or on a vote so that the public has a chance to comment on any of those changes. In terms of why we're doing uh, a new zoning ordinance, one, and I know uh, Mr. Coyne brought up uh, variances, uh, but granting variances isn't a sound way of uh, land planning, um, and we, so we need to update and modernize the terms in our zoning, zoning ordinance. For example, there weren't s cell towers all over the city in 1992 when, um, when the last one was passed. There wasn't Airbnbs. Um, the list could go on there. And also some, some and, I, and I believe that the regionalization part of it is a good benefit of this plan. It's because do we give some outside communities some cover in terms of the land use? Yes, we do, but there's also communities that give us cover because under current law, if we weren't to regionalize our zoning ordinance, we would have to designate a zone in the city to be a landfill. Um, you know, and. So do we give cover on some of the heavy industry that we have on Kaiser Avenue? Yes, we do. But at the same time, we're also not required to create our own landfill. Um, so, I mean, those are just a couple of the reasons uh, why a new zoning ordinance is uh, necessary. Variances should be given if you're change, you know, for a foot or two here, a foot or two there. Um, in terms of setbacks, um, egress, degress, you know, those sort of things. Variances shouldn't be, you know, okay, you're going to build a 100-foot building or a 50-foot building on something that's only zoned for 25 feet. Um, I don't think that's a proper way of uh, land planning. Uh, and I believe that's all I have for this evening, Mr. Voldenberg. 5B, for an introduction, an ordinance approving and accepting the City of Scranton capital budget for the year 2023, pursuant to section 904 of the City's Home Rule Charter. At this time, I'll entertain, I'll entertain a motion that item 5B be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question. 
So on the question, we discussed in caucus about um, this pretty much being a wish list. So I didn't agree with everything in the capital budget. So I'll be voting yes to move this legislation forward. But like I said during uh, caucus, I don't agree with spending $1.8 million to buy a building probably next door. Uh, and, I, and I used an analogy is like you don't buy a second home when, when you can barely pay for the first home especially as exiting Act 47. And you don't buy a property right next door, they're gonna, it's gonna be taken off the tax rolls. So like I said, I will, I, will, I will vote to push this through or move the capital budget itself to a final vote, but when this comes around again, I, I, in another form in the general budget, I, I'll be totally against, uh, against this purchase. Anyone else on the question? So also on the question, <clears throat> um, I'd like to reiterate what Mr. McAndrew said about City Hall expansion. Um, I, I do not agree with buying a, another property for the city um, unless it's clearly um, justified to us. Um, in public comment tonight, a, a discussion was, a topic was brought up about what we did during COVID, working from home, things like that. I think um, in areas such as that, COVID brought on some you know, some areas we wouldn't have thought of before, but I mean, is there a possibility to work from home if we're going to uh, do work on this building? I think at this current point in time, some of the staff in this building are working from home. Um, electric vehicles, I've, I've said it since the start. The, the price here, it's a $75,000 grant plus $213,000 of ARP money. Um, if you're doing the math on that, it's $20,000, $21,000 per car. These vehicles do not cost $21,000 per car. So, um, I mean, I've seen a lot of things on the electric vehicles, where the electricity comes from. I think it's a headache that the city doesn't need at this point in time, and it hasn't been properly cost out. And I think this is something that I've um, stated several times. If, if we're not uh, properly justifying some of these things, I, I'm not going to be in agreement with it. At this point in time, I'm 100% against electric vehicle, an electric vehicle fleet for this city. Um, even though I do understand there's some funding out there. Um, one more thing with this as well, and I'm going to come back to Mr. Voldenberg. Mr. Voldenberg, in, in this uh, capital budget, there was uh, one of the items that it was stated under was the special service support vehicle. And with the, with the little blurb about that vehicle, it stated that a committee finalized this report. Can we find out if a committee worked on the capital budget and who the members of that committee were? I'll ask that question, sir. All right, thank you very much. That's all. Anyone else on the question? Just in terms of the capital budget, I, I think there are a lot of good uh, investments in here, especially into our police and fire. Um, the one thing I wasn't too thrilled to see um, was the Engine 10 building feasibility study, not necessarily doing the feasibility study, but the, just the way that some of the wording um, was there. I know uh, looking back at you know some history of the Engine 10, just building being on East Mountain and when it was browned out uh, a couple of years or over a decade ago, there was a fire on East Mountain and the response time was severely delayed. So, and I know in here it does say that 75% of Engine 10's responses are west below Interstate 81, but I know just speaking personally, I don't care what a feasibility study says, I would never be in support of moving Engine 10 off East Mountain proper in general. It has to be on the mountain where they could respond to the mountain. West Mountain has uh, good response times from the station on Luzerne Street. Um, Manuka has good responses from Engine 4. Uh, north, the north side has uh, good responses from Truck 4. So I, I think that we are situated in terms of our firehouses uh, pretty well, um, but I would never be in support of moving um, any and the Engine 10 building off East Mountain um, at all. I agree. Um, and in, just in terms of uh, City Hall operations expansion, um, I'm definitely in favor of a study to see what, what we need and what, um, you know, what, what we have, uh, what we need moving forward. Um, in terms of, you know, 
in terms of an expansion, um, you know, I think if we could rectify maybe some of our security and ADA concerns for 1.8 instead of spending 1.1 1 point, 1 point or a million 1.2 just to make this building ADA compliant, I think that's something that needs to be a part of the conversation. But I will always hold the opinion that this building should be City Hall. It should be the main City Hall. This building belongs to the people of this city and it should stay that way. But I do think we need you know, a study of how we use our facilities, not just here, but I think uh, you know, citywide in terms of what could be used at Sorrenti, what could be used or what, what could be placed on the police station, DPW, and such. Um, so that's all I have on the capital budget. Anyone else on the question? All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. I'd like to make a motion to authorize the city clerk to place a legal notice in the newspaper summarizing the proposed capital budget and to include locations where copies of the capital budget can be viewed by the public. Second. There's a motion on the floor and a second to place a legal notice in the newspaper for the capital budget on the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. I'd also like to make a motion that we schedule a public hearing for the capital budget to be held on Tuesday, September 20th, 2022 at 5.45 p.m. Second. There's a motion on the floor and a second to schedule a public hearing on the capital budget. On the question? On the question, I'd just like to say that, that I hope a, a lot of the good citizens of the city of Scranton come out to uh, make comment on this budget. Anyone else on the question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5C for introduction and ordinance requiring the Scranton tax collector to waive additional charges for real estate taxes beginning in tax year 2023 under certain circumstances when notice was not received pursuant to Pennsylvania Act 57 of 2022. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5C be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question. All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5D for introduction and ordinance adopting the debt management policy for the city of Scranton attached hereto and marked as exhibit A. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5D be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question. On the question, I'm happy to see uh, that we're, we finally have a debt, mo debt management policy uh, on our agenda. Uh, this, is, this was the last piece in terms of the Act 47 uh, exit uh, suggestions that were made uh, by Pell. Um, so we actually have a way where we could manage our debt going forward. Um, and it's really, this to me is the last step of leaving Act 47. Uh, anyone else on the question? All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5E for introduction a resolution. Authorizing reappointment of Heather McCone, 341 White Birch Drive, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18504, as a member of the Human Relations Commission for a five-year term. Heather McCone's term is effective September 16, 2022, and will expire on September 16, 2027. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5E be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question. Uh, on the question, this one is coming back. Is it just because um, the original appointment was just a short term and this is a, a new term? I believe it was just a short to so finish like two, out. So two it was an unexpired so. term and that okay. this is for a I wasn't a sure if there was like some <laughs> changes in the term. Or I believe we, we could check on that, but, I'll, but I'll, I believe that what was what the case was on that one. Anyone else on the question? All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5F for introduction, a resolution. Appointment of Michael McDermott, 1219 Stanton Street, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18508, 
as a member of the Housing Appeals Review Board, effective upon execution of the resolution. Mr. McDermott will fill the vacancy left by Charles Botanis, whose term expired November 24, 2018, and was held over. Mr. McDermott will complete the five-year term that followed Mr. Botanis and is set to expire November 24, 2023. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5F be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question. All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5G for introduction, a resolution. Appointment of Patricia Dunlavey, 815 Richter Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18510, as a member of the Scranton Ethics Board, effective upon execution of the resolution. Ms. Dunlavey will be replacing Stephanie L. Bressler, Ph.D., whose term expired August 31, 2022. Patricia Dunlavey will serve a three-year term, which will expire on August 31, 2025. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5G be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question. All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, and so moved. 5H for introduction, a resolution. Ratifying and approving the execution and submission of the grant narrative by the City of Scranton Police Department to fiscal year 2022 Edward Byrne Justice Assistant Grant Account for up to $108,975 to provide funding to combat hate crime, promote public trust between communities and criminal justice agencies, reduce violent crime, community violence intervention, address COVID-19 criminal justice challenging, sustain innovations and crime analysis and investigation. <coughs> At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5H be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question, all those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, and so moved. 5I for introduction, a resolution authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to waive the residency requirements for Melissa A. Saddlemeyer in her capacity as fiscal coordinator of the Office of Community Development for the City of Scranton. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5I be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question. On the question, so first of all, I consistently vote against residency waivers because of not being fair and equitable with all the other city employees. In a city of 70,000 residents, I still believe we have qualified residents to do these types of jobs. Secondly, these ARPA positions are temporary and are exhausted at the end of the ARPA fund distribution. These positions should have been ones of private contractors without benefits. When a person is appointed and a residency waiver is requested, it looks to me like that this person appointed looks to be more permanent and will remain around, remain either around a lot longer or be in a future budget uh, with legacy. So, um, for them reasons, I'm voting no. Anyone else on the question? Um, I, I'm, I'm going to be voting yes on this uh, this evening, but I would like, I'm noticing that um, I'm not seeing a resume for this individual. So, that's something I'd like to see prior to uh, any further vote moving forward. On the question, I, I agree. I um, was curious too because I think the reason behind the residency waiver was um, because of this candidate's qualifications over the other candidates that were interviewed. So I wanted to know uh, what those qualifications were and, and what put um, Ms. Saddlemere above the, the other candidates to help me with my decision. Anyone else on the question? And Mr. Voldemort, could we ask if any other candidates were interviewed? I will, sir. Sir Voldenberg, could you ask how many applied, how many were interviewed, if you could? I Thank will, you. Mr. King. I, and then I a thought, copy of the resume. And the copy, um, yes. I'm sorry, I thought in the backup that it said eight interviews were conducted. I don't know. 
I forget if it said eight interviews or eight. It says eight or, interviews were conducted. Or does it say eight? In, okay. Hey, while you're asking. I just didn't know if it was eight interviews or eight people applied. Uh, while we're asking, could you find out how many lived in Scranton? Or live in Scranton, I should say? Thank you. I will, Mr. McAndrew. So I will, I'll vote tonight to introduce this legislation, but I will be interested to see the response to the questions that were posed uh, before I decide whether or not to approve this, whether to vote yes on this or not. Uh, anyone else on the question? All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. The ayes have it and so moved. 5J for introduction, a resolution ratifying and approving the execution and submission of the grant application by the City of Scranton to the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development for funding for up to $450,000 in partnership with Scranton Primary Health Care Center through the Community Development Block Grant Coronavirus Program as part of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5J be introduced into its proper committee. So move. Second. On the question. All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, and so moved. 5K for introduction, a resolution. Reappointment of John J. Harrington, Jr., 102 Lilac Lane, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18505, as a member of the Scranton Parking Authority, effective upon execution of the resolution. Mr. Harrington's term was held over. Mr. Harrington's five-year term will expire on June 1st, 2027. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5K be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. Second. On the question. All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, and so moved. 5L for introduction, a resolution authorizing reappointment of Paul J. Strunk, 3 Cross Drive, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18505, as a member of the Human Relations Commission for an additional five year term effective upon execution of the resolution. Mr. Strunk's term expires on September 16, 2022. His new term will expire on September 16, 2027. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5L be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. Second. On the question. All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, and so moved. Sixth order, no business at this time. Seventh order, 7A, previously tabled. File the council number 16, 2022 authorizing the mayor and other appropriate officials of the city of Scranton to take all necessary actions to implement the HUD 2022 annual action plan for community planning and development programs to be funded under the community development block grant CDBG program, home investment partnership program, and emergency solution grants program for the period ending January 1st, 2022. What is the recommendation of the Chairperson for the Committee on Community Development? As Chairperson for the Committee on Community Development, I recommend final passage of item 7A. Is there a second? Second. On the question? Just on the question, um, Mr. Voldenberg said period ending, I believe it's period beginning uh, January 1st, 2022, just for clarification purposes. Thank you, Mr. King. Anyone else on the question? Roll call, please. Mr. King? Yes. Mr. Schuster? Yes. Dr. Rothschild? Yes. Mr. McAndrew? Yes. Mr. Dunningham? Yes. I hereby declare item 7A legally and lawfully adopted. Eighth order, 8A, file the council number 9, 2022. This piece of legislation is the updated zoning ordinance. It is tabled to allow for additional input and any changes and or amendments. Uh, council is expected to bring this back up uh, at some point uh, in October. Um, if there's no further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn.
This meeting's adjourned. Thank you.